Is Barbie garbage? Barbage, if you will. Was it sold to audiences under false pretenses? And if so, is there a danger here? According to a recent video from everyone's favorite YouTuber, The Critical Drinker, the answer to those questions is an emphatic yes. The truth, though, isn't quite so simple, and in fact, that video says a good deal more about the drinker and his critical practice than you might have thought. Join me as we wade through a truly baffling review and investigate the way the drinker continues to mislead his audience, the way contentious narratives are invoked to disguise poor criticism, and the way this video illuminates the fundamental dilemma at the heart of the Critical Drinker's channel. Let's get into it. The Drinker's video starts and ends with the accusation that Warner deliberately misled the public as to the character of their film. You guys really pulled off a miracle with this one, successfully duping all of us, including me, into believing that Barbie was going to be just another colourful, light-hearted, easy-going family comedy. Uh, this is from the trailer, by the way. You guys ever think about dying? Anyway, the drinker really hits this idea hard, hammering it home near the end in a way he doesn't often tend to do. Barbie really is a wolf in sheep's clothing, tricking people into watching it by promising one thing and delivering something very different. And I guess that's the thing that really struck me about this film. A lot of parents will have been duped into taking their daughters along to watch this movie, probably expecting the kind of breezy, colourful, family-friendly movie that was advertised, only to find them- So the nearest thing the drinker's video has to a thesis or a throughline, the string from which his usual motley assortment of nitpicks hang, is this idea that Warner pulled a fast one, tricked families into the cinema, before blasting them with an agenda-driven misandrist adult film. So before we dig into the significance of the drinker taking this angle, let's just check. Is he right? <laughs> Shit, sorry, I, I don't know how that sound file got in the mix. Is he right? Well, no. Let's talk about the trailers. I can't play them whole, copyright's a beach, but hey, to make sure I'm not misrepresenting them in my discussion, the one teaser and two trailers Warner dropped for this bad boy that formed the backbone of the film's pre-release PR are linked in the description, so give them a watch now if you fancy. The initial teaser, the only real look at this film the world was given until like three months back, was, well, it's the Space Odyssey referencing opening sequence, played I think in full. Because you know what kids love, you know what those little guys just go nuts for, you know what gets them hyped about going to the pictures? Stanley Kubrick references, those little bastards eat that shit up. But surely that's not the whole teaser? Well no, of course not. There's also a five second montage of random clips closing it out, so you know, at this point, is Barbie setting itself up as a lightweight kids flick, or is it maybe signalling it'll be a more thoughtful and adult affair? You'll have to decide that one, I guess. And those random clips focus on the cast, show off Margot Robbie, Ryan Gosling, Simu Liu, and plenty more. Emphasis on celebrity, on a sort of star power adults care about, was a staple tactic. Maybe the staple tactic of the film's publicity. But maybe I'm wrong. Maybe that doesn't sink this guy's thesis. Maybe the only thing kids love more than a Kubrick reference is recognizing their favorite SNL alumni. Yeah, anyway, the rest of these trailers gesture toward a similar direction, I think that's fair to say. I mean, you might look at the trailers and see the sex jokes and the 80s folk song sing-along. You might see a project driven more by star power than by its somewhat passe IP. You might see Barbie say she's been thinking about death. You might see a film, the premise of which isn't light-hearted, easy-going Barbie fun time, yay, but is instead very clearly a complication or subversion of the light-hearted, easy-going Barbie fun time, yay, you might expect when hearing the phrase Barbie movie. A film that looks to be family-friendly, sure, but not necessarily family-oriented. Not a kid's film, but a film kids can enjoy alongside their parents. You might look to the trailers and see all that, or you might not see it. The drinker certainly didn't, or at least he claims not to have. But on balance, I'm going to say yes. That big idea he opens with is pretty clearly a misrepresentation of the film's PR, and I don't anticipate a lot of pushback on that. If that's granted, then yeah, bro looks like a clown, but more importantly, great news. We can proceed with the video and get on our way toward the conclusion. That payoff's gonna be a doozy. But here's the thing, the quality of and intentions behind the rest of the drinker's review also play a role in that conclusion, so really sorry, I know you guys hate it when I go through a drinker video and pluck it apart, but it looks like we've got to do at least a little of this. One bit I really like is here. 
All the important jobs are done by the Barbies, and the Kens just kind of exist. They've got no inherent value, they contribute nothing, they have no power or say in how their society is run, and they're basically looked down on as a bit silly and irrelevant by the Barbies. Oh my goodness, what could the writers possibly be trying to tell us about their views on men? <laughs> What we see here is the drinker brushing right up against meaningful criticism and then blowing right past it. I'll expound. Let's put our thinking caps on. In a film about femininity and about female existence under patriarchy, this idea the film plays with now and then, that Ken's are eye candy, are peripheral, that they don't get an equal slice of the pie, what could this mean? Could it be a tongue-in-cheek inversion of our familiar gender politic? Could the point here be a sort of defamiliarization of the role women are often still forced into, flipping those traits, eye candy, peripheral, subordinate, back onto male characters in order to highlight how and why society's foisting of these upon anyone is a problem? Or could the fact that, regardless of context, men are on the bottom rung of the ladder, are subservient, simply mean film thinks men bad, the creators hate men, and that's that. The drinker hitches his cart to the latter option, and that's both kind of funny and a huge missed opportunity to actually say something halfway insightful. See, symbolically speaking, the way Barbie Land works is twofold. The subordination of the Kens shows the drawbacks of our currently existing gender imbalances, while the Barbie's successes show the heights women could achieve were these imbalances not a factor. Yes, there is an inequality here, but it's one being used to make a point about equality. And crucially, something the drinker seems to miss later on as well, Barbie Land is not the film's recommendation. It's not a blueprint for gender utopia. It isn't reality, it can never be, and it was never supposed to be. Even in universe, it was explicitly created for a purpose, that purpose being the inspiration of girls, to show them what they could do and be personally. That is the idea here, but well, that concept is a little messy. Given the Kens, Barbies, and Allens alike are seemingly endowed with some degree of sapience, or at least the potential for it, Barbie Land's limited opportunities for Kens is a bit troubling. The film kinda hangs a lantern on this with the closing voiceover, but lampshading an issue isn't the same as resolving that issue. So yes, this would, I think, be grounds for a valid critique of if not the film's ideas, then at least the way those ideas are delivered. But you see the issue, right? To get to this knot, you have to actually think about the film, about the things that make you uneasy, about why they make you uneasy before you hit record. And honestly, I'm probably giving the guy too much credit by assuming any of that even registered with him, that he didn't just woke spot the surface level dynamic of man being dominated by women and call it a day. After all, a broken clock is right twice a day, and by that same logic, if you let a half-cut fool rant for a couple of years about dozens of films, statistically he is gonna bump into some real problems eventually. That doesn't mean he'll actually critique them, it doesn't even mean he's able to. Just that, yeah, he'll end up mouthing off in their general vicinity before going on to shout at more clouds. Moving on, this criticism is also a bit odd. Like, one guy literally walks up to Barbie and slaps her in the ass, in the middle of a crowded boardwalk, in broad daylight, in front of her boyfriends. Go with me here. The real world in this film isn't all that real. Anyone who's seen the film will recall that things are often a little exaggerated. Or do Mattel executives regularly engage in high-octane car chases? Maybe that's an America thing. Viewers from LA, please do tell me the last time you saw Enon Kreitz gunning it down Pacific Avenue. Given this, it seems strange that this moment gets targeted by the realism police and something like the Mattel chase doesn't, when public sexual assault is the thing that, you know, actually happens sometimes. But of course, the idea of an otherwise realistic world contorting itself to overstate the frequency of assault by evil men supports the spiteful hatred of men line the drink is pursuing, and by extension the corruptive leftist propaganda problem it implies, more than a recognition of this world's wider exaggerated realism would. So that recognition isn't given because withholding it allows this narrative to continue forming. And this kind of thing makes up the body of the drinker's video. Rapid fire nitpicks that come and go just quick enough to hide the fact that most don't really work. 
For instance, he notes Barbies change depending on how their owners play with them, and then goes on to criticize this concept by listing things which are not their owners playing with them. Do you have any idea how many Barbie dolls must get broken, or thrown in trash compactors, or set on fire, or eaten by family pets every single day? Or take this reading the drinker offers. So you're a woman who wants to be a mother or a homemaker? Screw you, fascist! If you're thinking, hang on, what about America Ferrara's character? arguably the real heart of this film. What about the way she very clearly draws her strength, the strength that saves Barbie and Barbie Land from motherhood? What about that already iconic line near the film's close? We mothers stand still so that our daughters can look back and see how far they've come. The way that sentiment and the film more widely celebrates the mother-daughter bond. If you're thinking about any of those things, um, stop thinking about them, I guess. If that's not enough, how about the way Drinker acts confused by the Barbie's quick subjugation? Question how the supposedly intelligent, empowered, and self confident Barbies were so easily subjugated by Ken and the others. This is the kind of awkward little. Power Despite there being a line in the film which directly answers that question. Maybe he uh, didn't like the explanation, though, and elected to ignore it. You know, like an intelligent person would. And shockingly, some of these nitpicks are just outright untrue. The real world and all the men in it are shown to be universally, irredeemably horrible. Because of course they are. What about Duolingo Husband, the he's just like me for real king? What about him? Did I blink during a split second shot of him kicking a dog or something? Turns out, if you accuse any of these guys of lying when they demonstrably are, a bunch of their buddies sick their goons on you, so at the risk of that happening again, gee, I'm noticing a trend. Look, I'm not going to mince my words. This is bad criticism. I don't just mean it's based on misleading or untrue observations, it's also just bad criticism, actively hostile to complex thought. Barbie Land privileges Barbies? Wow, I guess that means the film wants us to oppress men. New gender roles are adopted and abandoned quickly by both Kens and Barbies, following their exposure to LA business patriarchy. Isn't that an awkward little paradox? Wait, wait, what's that? You're, you're, you're saying it's intentional, to, to point out the way gender is learned and the way patriarchy can seem attractive, even to the women and men at harms. Uh, no, sorry mate, don't care, those words are too big. The review portion of his video finishes with a ham-fisted attempt to apply the gender politic of Barbie Land to our reality and then to criticise the result, despite, again, that not being the point of Barbie Land. But this hostility to just thinking is made most apparent about midway through the drinker's video. Barbie eventually finds the kid who plays with her, who turns out to be an asshole communist activist feminist that I think the movie wants us to empathise with, but fuck me, for the life of me I could not tell you why. Let me help you out. Surprisingly, no. We're not really supposed to empathise with the girl who calls Barbie a fascist and makes her cry. Maybe the girl does raise a kind of valid point or two, but she does so in a really mean way, and that's bad. We're not supposed to be on her side. Yet. Because there's this cool thing called an arc she gets. Over the course of the film, by reconnecting with her mother, she begins to see the worth in Barbie, and the value of aspirational figures, just as Barbie sees that the kid has a point, that aspirational symbols aren't solutions in themselves, yada yada yada. We're supposed to like where she ends up, not where she starts, which is honestly a kinda mean-spirited caricature of Zuma leftism. But in a supremely telling moment, the drinker seems to have spotted that caricature, filtered it through the Hollywood is leftist and evil pipe he's got in his brain, and landed on the idea that we're supposed to like and agree with everything nasty the girl says simply because it's couched in a woke aesthetic. That slippage is amusing, and illustrates how thoughtless, how knee-jerk this critique is. Woke means we're supposed to like it, and it's unlikable, so film bad. There is no self-awareness here. Again, this is bad criticism. This is all bad criticism, but it doesn't matter. The opening of the drinker's video lays out that misrepresentation of the film's PR, but it does something else too. It very consciously and very jarringly inserts Barbie into the canon of hated woke objects. Barbie is like the deformed, mutated rage child of Captain Marvel, Ghostbusters 2016, and She-Hulk. So, I'm an expert at controlling my anger because I do it- I don't remember asking you a goddamn thing! It seems a very transparent move, serving to designate Barbie as a battleground in the war against wokeness, and to turn his video from a simple Barbie review into another instalment in that war. 
If this is the case, the result of this scaling up is that this abstract narrative of wokeness supersedes the specific film ostensibly under review, and the specifics of that film. To the legions of drinker viewers who are slurping the reactionary Kool-Aid, the quality of his review, the validity of his objections, all this becomes relatively unimportant, because the battle is already won, the film is already designated as woke, and woke is already bad. It doesn't matter if he lies about the film, it doesn't matter if he thinks about the film, it doesn't matter if they think about the film, because it isn't about whether or not the men are bad, about whether or not this detail or that is explained, or whether or not we're supposed to sympathise with the mean lefty girl. The narrative matters. The shoddy criticism that makes up the rest of a video like this only needs to sound convincing, to scan once in order to legitimise that narrative, and its subsumption of the work under review. The result of this tendency writ large is a culture in which movies aren't worthwhile for their ideas, their performances, or how they're able to affect their viewers. They're worthwhile only insofar as they can be converted into clicks and into rhetoric. And let's return to that rhetoric, shall we? What an inspiring message for impressionable young girls. The thing is, none of this would have been quite so insidious if the marketing hadn't done everything in its power to keep it a secret. We're told that Warner and Mattel have tricked families into seeing their film, and that this is a problem. This is, quote, insidious, not simply misleading. The language used suggests it's not just a question of whether little Timmy and Brenda are gonna have a good time. The drinker recommends you don't bring your kids here, and that you'll thank him for that later. It's not very often that I say this in my reviews, but if you're a parent and you're thinking about taking your kids along to see Barbie, then the drinker recommends you skip this one and do literally anything else with them. Believe me, you'll thank me later. The implication being that bringing them would risk interpolating those kids into this dangerous leftist mindset. The eagle-eyed, or rabbit-eared I guess, among you might recognise how similar this sounds to that groomer narrative that's been doing the rounds over there in normal country for a while now, and to the related strands of anti-woke nay cultural Marxism theories the drinkers podcast buddies like to bandy about. But hey, let's be generous and allow for the possibility that this similarity is accidental. That this alt-right substrate is a result of oversight on the drinker's part instead of malice or fervour. Either way, the video ends with a recommitment to Barbie as wokeness narrative fodder, and to the idea that it's succeeding because the film's advertising campaign lied. That's interesting. For a while now, as more and more people have caught onto the reactionary grift, the Barbie question has loomed. We've known for a while that the film would be a financial success, so the difficulty it posed to your chuds and your grifters, the get woke, go broke crowd, was clear. Wokeness in this sense is an intentionally vague and malleable label, as I've discussed in previous videos, but there's really no workable formulation of it that wouldn't include the Barbie film. How, then, is that sacred mantra to be preserved? How can Barbie's runaway success be anything but an open refutation of Get Woke, Go Broke? The drinker, knowingly or not, though I suspect knowingly, has furnished this movement with an answer. Barbie tricked the world. People were lured to see it under false pretenses. It doesn't count as a counterexample because the trailers lied. As we've seen, that isn't really true. But when has truth ever got in the way of this lot before? The Drinker's Barbie video then might be more than a loose collection of inaccurate jabs. It might be an effective employment of dishonesty, a carefully calculated, almost plausible justification for the continuation of that anti-woke grift his fans so rapidly claim he's not a part of. To be clear though, I am not stating that this is the case. It is a possibility, sure, but there is another one. And that's that the drinker isn't pushing these narratives intentionally, isn't pursuing an inaccurate framing of the film in order to help the reactionary anti-woke grift continue, and isn't trying to couch his inaccurate review in this sort of Mott and Bailey structure where flaws and poor criticism don't matter because woke film bad anyway. The other possibility is that he's not ideologically committed to any of this, and is simply exploiting it. Exploiting an audience that doesn't care if your review's built on lies, misrepresentations, and nonsensical nitpicks, so long as it's targeting a woke product, and that he's doing this either out of laziness or because he's not a good enough critic to do his job any other way. You know, turning out formulaic thriller novels and clickable little morsels of hate is one thing, but actually engaging with art is another. 
So his Barbie video isn't interesting because it's full of porkies, or because it sometimes plays like he fell asleep in the theater. It's interesting because it lays out pretty clearly the dilemma at the heart of the Critical Drinker channel. Is he just a chud on the anti-woke grift that's been able to maintain a kind of plausible deniability in the way a, say, Geeks and Gamers hasn't? Or is he just a hack, unable or unwilling to produce well-written videos who's found a strategy that requires neither? What's the answer? Well, here's mine. Does it matter? Does it change anything? Either way, a get woke, go broke Barbie exemption has been furnished. Either way, the criticism on display here is largely drivel. And either way, we're probably all better off not watching. Oh, and just for all time's sake, they were so filled with rage and hatred and bitterness that it just had to come spewing out onto the screen. Thank you for watching. If you want to help this reach a wider audience, likes, comments, and shares are all very much appreciated. If you'd like to help support me more directly, Patreon pledges of any level are a huge help. And just because on the rare occasions I put out videos like this, I always get a bunch of comments along the lines of, wow, stop clout chasing, make your own videos, don't just drama farm bigger names. Just, just look at my channel, man. I've got more than 200 videos, and this is the third about this guy. The vast majority of my content is about media, not about people misreading that media. So if you comment something like that, I'll know you haven't actually watched to the end, and I'll therefore instantly disregard your opinion. If you want to hear me talk more Barbie, less drinker, then hey, check out the last video I posted. Otherwise, cheers, bye, and special thanks as always to my Patreon supporters on screen now, especially Daniel Goldhorn, Ryan Emily, Thomas R, and Weirdy Beardy.